Welcome to Slow 303. For those of you that have been involved with CORD and CDEM for the past few years, you've probably seen us go through this dog and pony show over the last couple of years. It's always a, a contentious topic. We always leave with more questions than answers. And in fact, last year, this group walked away going, all right, we got to fix this. We were energized. We took all those problems. We said, this year, we're going to knock the snot out of this thing. We're going to do a terrific job. We're going to answer all these problems. We're going to come back and do a great presentation, a monstrous presentation. We're going to put this thing to bed once and for all. And we learned two things, <laughs> at least. One is this is way more complicated than we thought. There may not be real clear answers, but that's okay. That in itself is the answers. And two, we learned that Cord is not going to let us dominate their meeting just because we've gotten full of ourselves. Um, our plan was a big two-day session with uh, invited attendance the first day, teach people how to write slows, actually give them homework, give them perhaps fictitious students and have them write the slows, and then we'd look at them that night. The next day, we'd have another big meeting where we'd present them, and we'd analyze them, and that didn't work. So we've got 45 minutes to go through some issues here, and we're going to try and move fairly quickly. Um, we've got Sarah Ronan Bennell from Indiana. Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Oh, I'm Close. so sorry. I knew I was going to screw that up. Are you, are you, are you leaving? Did you get a new job? Yeah, right. Thank you. <laughs> no. Colin Hegarty, I hope from Hennepin. Close. It's in Minnesota. Close. <laughs> Excellent. This is why Tom is leading this. He's just already going in a great mode. Chrissy Babcock, who I knew was from Colorado until this morning when I looked her up. <laughs> She's from Chicago. I knew that. You see. <laughs> Matt Ryan from my sister program, University of Florida in Gainesville. Go Gators. Uh, Kathy Hiller from U Arizona. Damon Cool from Carillion. And I'm from University of Florida, Jacksonville. I apologize for that. Um, <coughs> I'm Jax, right? You're Jax. I'm okay. Gainesville. Excellent. Uh, so welcome. We, uh, this is, how do I make this sucker work? You know, there's a note here that says it needs new batteries. Maybe we just do it on that. Okay, good. Yeah. Welcome to Florida. The obligatory homage to Leonard Skinner. Um, the point behind this, though, is we do request. We've got a playlist we're going to run through, but please, if there's something we're missing, if there's something you guys want to bring up, don't hesitate to holler out. We've got seven core objectives, seven core questions we're going to try and hit and answer, but I want everybody to feel free to to you know, raise their hand and say, wait a minute, you're missing the point. I want to know about this. Towards that end, can we ask the room real quick, how many people here would view themselves as program directors or primarily letter readers or interpreters? Okay. Stand up real quick if you're a slow reader. Stand up. <laughs> Can't see those hands. Maybe a third, a quarter, a third. All right, how many are writers? That's your job. You're putting them together. You're sending them out. You're advocating for your students. And then anybody that wears both of those hats, the schizophrenic middle. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to hit about that? All right, moving on. Um, the very first one, we'll start with some low-hanging fruit here. Recognize the importance that the slow plays in creating a full application. Recognize the weight the slow has in influencing whether or not somebody's going to get an invite for an interview and, and, and perhaps some real impact on their rank list. Um, this is probably a no-brainer. I imagine most of the people in the room know this already, but for anybody who's not convinced, maybe so, uh, new folks. I missed the conference hall and I got assigned this slide. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but I did do some homework this morning. So there were two recent surveys within the last uh, set three years of program directors that asked specifically about how important the slow was in terms of who they interview uh, for residency. Uh, one was Jeff Love's paper, uh, 2014. There were uh, 150 program directors, and they said 60% said they required one or more slower at that time to interview. And uh, an additional 36% said that they recommended at least one slower to interview. And then the most recent paper that came out was uh, Kevin King. Are you in the room? 
he probably knows this data backwards and forwards. So the West Gem Education Supplement just a couple months ago that came out, um, he reported a survey that he did of 135 respondents on the CORD listserv, uh, and 80% said that uh, they required a rotation to interview, and 47% required one slow to interview. Uh, only 10% said that they would offer interviews with no slows. Uh, so this is obviously really important. That survey also found that um, 97% said two to interview or fewer, and 95% two or fewer to rank. So slows are really important. It sounds like program directors want at least one to offer an interview and really want two in order to rank someone. And in addition to that, um, in the program director survey that was done uh, with uh, Jeff Love as the first author, it talks about which item in the application is um, influential and asks the program directors to rank them. And the slow or slower at that time was the most important item in a student's application over the MSPE, their grades, et cetera. Yeah, so my take on this is, this confers great responsibility on us as writers. It's a powerful tool. It's incumbent on us to, to be careful, to use it wisely. And it's important for program directors to take it seriously. This is not something you can gloss over. You may have to take a couple of minutes and really analyze the slow to get the important data. All right. Uh, so this kind of brings us to the next question. As advisors, estimate a realistic number of slows needed based on a student's background and, and competitiveness. And we kind of touched on this just a minute ago. But is there anything else you would want to add in terms of how should these folks, as writers, advise their students? All right, PD's in the room. How many do you need? Show of hands, one. Two. More than two. Okay, so two looks like a magic number. Uh, and I would agree with that. A home and away... How many of you are happy with two homes from a student who's not at your institution? One? Anybody else happy with that? Okay. So if you're going to get two, one of them should be from away from your institution. Seems like good consensus in the room there. Chrissy, what do you say? I completely agree. Um, two is plenty for us, one home, one away. We talked about this a little bit last year, but I think it's important to reinforce one group home slow and then a separate slow from the same rotation doesn't help to have two. That's really the same rotation as far as I'm concerned, or from an ultrasound or a PEDS or something. These should be two core EM rotations. And it's one thing that I have seen escalating over the years as the panic of I need another slow, that I think programs are helping those students out who didn't get to do away or decided late in EM uh, that, okay, well, we'll write your group slow, and then we'll have your mentor write another slow, and it's the same rotation, or maybe the two extra weeks of ultrasound. And I think just with the raise of hands here, you can see that's not helping your students out very much. What about um, a group slow from the home, and then it was So the question was, what about a group slow and then a, another slow from someone at the same institution who knows the student over four years from doing research? Is that what you said? Yeah, I, I mean, so you're saying you, so you do nutritional research, but you don't know the student over four years from doing research. So you're saying you can mentor someone in the research for years, and you want to also recommend them. I would say write a traditional letter recommendation in that case and not slow. So they still just have that one group slow from your institution. And I know many of you have seen our chair's letter, which is the dean's letter for emergency medicine for all of our students, which is exactly that. Their mentor can contribute to that letter. Their research mentor can contribute to that letter. Other people can contribute. And it becomes a, a, a running document of a dean's letter for emergency medicine for us. And I've started to see a few more of those coming across my plate, and those are incredibly helpful. Not as helpful as a slow, but those are helpful. I have kind of an unusual situation in that I'm from University of Vermont, which is one of the very few medical schools in the country that currently does not have a residency program. But coming does to a theater have a, near you. What? Coming to a theater near I you. I know. Coming to a theater <laughs> near you very soon. We've just hired a PD. Um, but for the next, you know, for the past several years and the next year, I've been advising all my students, we have a required rotation, so they have to do a rotation with us, and I've been 
asking them to do at least one, probably two, aways at sites with residency programs so that they can get two slows from residency program people. But then we have gotten an exemption to write slows even though we don't have a residency. And I've been doing slows from our program, but I've had a number of students say, would you write me a letter instead? And I'm just wondering, a regular letter. I've been telling them I, a slow, even from us, who mean nothing, a slow is more important than than a regular letter. But I just wanted to see, I, I have no idea if I'm right or not. I want to see a slow. And I think that, I think your, 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 your slows are legitimate because you are educating them. They're doing a rotation. Yeah, you're evaluating them. Yeah. So, Father Ryan gives you permission to write slows. All right. So APDs and PD, so APDs and PDs in the room, let's help her out. How many of you want to see a slow? How many want to, don't want a slow? They want just a letter, letter of support in the student. Show hands for slow. And we're done. <laughs> I write in, I don't have a match list, you know, I, I'm not on the committee because we don't have, we don't have that no, and, in and, our program. And to be honest with you, unfortunately, no matter what, for the people in the room and the program directors, your slow, unfortunately, is not as impactful. That being said, it's still more helpful than writing a diatribe about their great work in Jamaica. So. Very wise. For their application. And I think the one other thing we wanted to touch on, you know, while you highlight my res my students are getting three, is at our shop we're really trying to advise our students to stop going after three. Unless we know slow one needs some help. And so that's got to be a communication, an open dialogue with your slow writers and your student on the internet, obviously you're not disclosing that to them, but understanding where that student is and that they very well may be that person. But your AOA 250, 250, who just smoked their rotation, does, please don't force them out to three other places unless they, you're like, I really got to get to California. So, all right. Now, Mary, I, just real quick, I think we have to take into account, though, those students that can't get to slows except for their home institution. I've got two two people in my program right now. One was seven months pregnant in July and advised she could not travel. It, I know the timing is not great, but she absolutely could not go anywhere. And so she was stuck with two home slows. Thankfully, we loved her and we decided to keep her. Um, the second one was a student from a osteopathic school that was closed out of rotations at places that wrote slows until October. She started mid-October. She got two interviews. Top of her class, great student, couldn't get a rotation to save her life, relatively new school osteopathic school. The thankfully, issue of being thankfully able, her rotation was with us yeah. and we got her. The <laughs> issue of being able to get visiting rotations or away rotations is a huge issue, probably beyond the scope of what we can talk about today and certainly can potentially affect students' ability to get a standardized letter of evaluation. No doubt about it. Um, and there are spe probably special circumstances that we can all think of where there is some issue with an application with slows that makes us give that student different advice than the average student, right? Be Paul, before you jump in, can I just ask a question? Because I'm this is a curious situation, and I'm sure all of us could see falling into it at some point. For the slow readers in the room, how much value added is a second slow from the same institution when you understand that it's basically a situation where they're, they can't get another slow versus just explaining in the first one? So maybe it's better not to expend the effort in writing a second slow from the home institution and just do a really good job of explaining in the first slow. The only key with that is there's some programs out there that filter and will not look at anybody unless they have two so that was exactly my question. I think this whole too slow, we understand that, but our students are saying we need to get this done by September, 
and clerkship directors are having a hard time scrambling, saying we can't get everybody in home and away by September. So I, I've heard from PD saying one is okay to get an interview, but we'd like to see a second one. But what our students are hearing is that I need to get two rotations by September, which is, I mean, they're already very anxious to begin with, and I know clerkship directors are are hearing that, you know, every well, we'll try what to get we have them a done is slot. decided to have our uh, first-year medical students do their away rotations. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of this is going to fall under the category of, yeah, you're right, but sometimes life isn't fair. You were pregnant at the end of medical school, and it's not fair that that should work against you, but that's going to make a challenge for you. Yeah, it's not fair. You couldn't get an early rotation, and you're going to have to apply a little bit more widely. It's not fair, but sometimes life isn't. You <clears throat> We do our best to minimize that, but we're not going to make it all go away. It's got to click on. But Tom, it's also important, like, look at everybody in the room. Unfortunately, it's still the reality. This is the preponderance of people and what they believe, and we have to work within that context. And we're, we're trying to bend it a little bit as it goes, but it's still the reality, and we want the writers in here to see all those hands raised. Right. So forgive me a little bit. Um, my I, my name is Michelle Dorfsman. I'm the new program director at Pitt, and we had a program director there for 28 years who um, really counseled our students, you know, to get one slow, not to do an away rotation, and um, we don't do consensus slows. Um, so all of a sudden, none of our students were getting interviews and not matching, and it was super stressful. And um, I took over and I said to him, you know, I think we need to change things a little bit. Um, you know, we need to advise them differently. So just this is very important for me to hear everybody's thoughts. And I'm very surprised to hear some of this. But how many people um, require a consensus letter? Because I got emails from people this year saying, what's wrong with this person? Why didn't they get a consensus letter? And we are planning on doing that this year for our students. But um, we had never done it before. Yeah, Chris, you want to take that? My thought is I can most... say I don't have an answer to that, but I do know that uh, there is at least one researcher actively looking at this right now. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know the answer. I guess we will pursue it. There, yeah. yeah advice for that. There's right. been some cultural shift toward weighting of group slows more than individual authored slows, but that's sort of like a cultural thing that hasn't been documented in the literature and um, and it's sort of word of mouth. And it goes both ways too, right? Because a group slow isn't really a group slow. I mean, I don't sit there <laughs> with oh, everybody in my department around the table. Well, they read it but well, hopefully one of the, yeah, but hopefully one of the things you'll take away as we talk later on about the importance of taking, if you're writing a group slow, that it really is a group slow and you take it really seriously because look how important it is. Quick show of hands, how many write a group slow? Wow. How many don't? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Get in line, Michelle. All right. <laughs> And one more thing, um, we actually did have a student who had to take care of an ill family member and couldn't travel and was in the same situation about not being able to do an away rotation. And I don't know, of course, we got that student, and it turned out to be one of our star people who um, it was one of our faculty now and is amazing. But I, I, do, I do take that into account, and I am very opening and welcome to getting people who, of all different Isn't schools. Isn't Allegheny right I'm across the street? Yeah, most of Abby, but, you know. <laughs> Did you want? Um, yeah, so I would just go back to that two slow thing. So it seems like many of PDs and best say that that's okay for them to have only one slow and then they will invite interviews. Can we get that message out somewhere or make it like a, Hello, it's uh, published in, actually I saw Kevin King walk in. There he is right there. Uh, this is Dr. Kevin King, who just published the seminal research on this topic. <laughs> um, and it's in the Education Supplement for West Gem that just came out a couple months ago. Uh, how many slows do program directors want before they require, or how many do they require before they offer an interview? And it was 47% wanted one to interview. All right. Um, yes. I read and write 
right? Uh, cause I'm also on the application committee. Um, and I'm just intrigued in terms of if everybody wants two, what are the other two letters that everybody wants? So this is what I do with my clerkship director as a clerkship director role in writing letters is I do a group slow with the program director where we base it off of the evaluations of the faculty members and so on and so forth, as I'm sure you most do. And the probably, because I, I require the students to work one shift with either me or him, we have that one shift to go based off of, which is not really fair. So what I do is I set them up a shift with what I call a good slow writer, uh, which is someone who's written slows in the past, and they get four shifts with that person to watch their progression during the rotation. And then they write a slow. And I thought, I thought that that would be a very valuable slow for the student because that person would have watched them progress throughout the rotation. But now what I'm hearing is that that slow doesn't actually hold that much weight, which is kind of concerning <laughs> because we do put a lot of effort into that. And so now we have them doing their away rotation, which would be a third slow for them. So this fourth slow will come from a researcher that they've done research with or a mentor who they've had or an internal me a random internal medicine physician that they had on their rotation and core clerkship. So I'm just intrigued to know what these other slows are that everybody holds so valuable as opposed to my non-important individual slow. <laughs> Bring that up, they've talked about that already. Um, my thought on that would be that that's not hurting you that much. When I look at that, I'm gonna see the one letter from you and the one letter from your clinical faculty and say, this is one letter. Where's the second one? Sounded to me like you were gonna ask about what do I want for the third and fourth? I don't even look for them. If I've got two good slows, or in your case, one A, one B, and two, I'm kind of done looking. How, how many of you in here want to see a letter from the uh, clinical rotation and surgery? They really, really got along well with that surgeon. I think they did. And even if they did, I advise them that that probably is not read by most program directors on the interview trail. Um, what we do is we do two slows for them. They all, we're a small school, so we're only 40 two students a year, they all do three years of research. They're all required to have a publication. So their research mentor writes a letter, and then our chairs slash EM dean's letter is the fourth letter for them. And we found that to be pretty effective. Can, can we stop writing slows for non-clinical encounters? Because the slow, if you look at those buttons, how do you answer those questions if you haven't worked clinically with a student, honestly? If I just did ultrasound with that student, it does not matter if they are the next Brent Toma. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to do when you are, you know, managing uh, emergent patients and stuff like that. So I just, please, can we stop doing slows for research or for talks or for ultrasound or for anything but clinical encounters, and then we really only need the two slows? I think somebody up there has some insight. Yeah, so... Uh... You know, the slow, so back years ago, right, you had narrative letters. People don't love narrative letters. Everybody's great, right? It, that's why it doesn't matter to us if you get a matter from a surgeon, internal medicine, peds, whatever. The letter reads like Johnny did a great job. Johnny is great. It's not that helpful. Um, so what happened is we went to the slower to the slow. Program directors really value it because it has some objective component to it, so what's happened is EMS, ultrasound, tox, other rotations that aren't your standard EM rotations have liked the idea of trying to use that. And you're right, for a lot of them it doesn't totally fit because a lot of the questions we're asking don't apply if you're not clinically working with them taking care of standard ED patients. So heading into this application cycle, so right now you have the e-slow, you have another slow that's out there for people that are at schools that are too small to have enough students to answer that last question about the rank list. And we're going to add another one that's going to be for subspecialty rotations where we're going to change a lot of the questions to make it more focused on that. So it'll be hopefully better than just getting another narrative letter, but not inappropriately boxing them into using the slow questions. So that should be coming. We're hoping to get it up and running by June. Yep. One of the things that comes up, at least with the students that I advise, and this happens t typically later in the season when they're doing maybe their third or sometimes even their fourth rotation, is that they're worried that when they show up for interviews, if they rotated at a place and didn't get a letter from that place, that that looks like a, a red flag or is a worrisome thing. And so they're asking for slows in October and November and because they think that they need them, because if they don't get them, it looks like a, like a red flag. 
So the, the comment was, if there are students who are doing third and fourth rotations, they're asking for slows for those rotations, even in October and November, because the students are concerned that if they don't have a slow for those rotations, that it looks bad when they go to interview. Um, can I add something to that one? I run into this a lot, and I have people who show up in October, November, December, they want something, and I think, I can't really write a slow, because I can't factor in their... Their position, I've already set up my bell curve, but I'll write them sort of a modified slow, and I know that there's some taboo to that. But the top of it looks like a slow, so it grabs their attention. <laughs> Let it be. Right. And then but down I mean, in the narrative, it just says, this person you are an with outlier. Us. I can't rank him great, but he did just fine. We're ranking him pretty highly. He's great. And it gives them that confirmation. Yeah, they rotated. No, they didn't stink up the rotation. The, the, yeah, we were happy to say they did a great job. The issue with that is what people are mumbling is that there is no place in the ERIS application to accept those slows if they've already filled the slots for that are, they're allotted for letters of recommendation. Three letters, two of them are slows. Like, you don't see them in the letter. You're just worried that it looks bad. It but no one can see it. The transcripts are not released to the residents. I have no idea where they rotate unless they tell me. Right. I think that if, if you're without a slow from your home and you're away, then to me, they're what's what's missing here, right? I I know you went, you told me you went and did something in August, and why don't you have a slow? But after down the road, there's there's no way to know unless someone tells you. I do too. I do too. And. Maybe maybe if I can just ask the program directors in the room, so say you get this late slow and someone that you've already interviewed, does it not help you when you rank them? So I think it's still valuable to write late slows. Maybe I'm the outlier. So um, I, I, as somebody who accepts that information, uh, one of the things that we've gone, Tom and I've gone to doing is if somebody comes in and they're, they, we know that they're going to do a rotation in November, December, somewhere around like that. We'll call. So I'm looking at Jen because I know I've done this with Jen Avegno. Uh, I'll call and say, okay, Jen, how did this person do on the rotation? I take that information and I use it as we discuss, but I don't necessarily require Jen slow from that person because I know it's not going to come in, but she can give me an idea of where that, that information is. So I use the information as if I've got a slow, but I, I make the phone call and I ask the, the students to tell me if they're going to go do a rotation. So I don't have, they don't have to feel like they have to get one. I just, I ask, I ask for the information. So I have, I have tons of students who really can't get a rotation until October. So what they do is they might have their, they have their home slow and then they have that letter from whoever they did their medicine rotation with. But I, I feel like whether it's their second or their, you know, I don't advise them to do three rotations, but a lot of them do. And, and for whatever reason, like you said, maybe they want to see California. Maybe they think they have, you know, they have family here and they want to go here. I think if you do the rotation, you deserve a slow, whether it's October or November. If you put in the effort, you know, I, you know, I tell them this is not going to be in by ERS, but if I'm interviewing you in December, I'm going to see this and I'm going to show, you know, I know that you showed up and, Good for you. And this might be your second slow in October. So I, you know, whether, whether it's us having a conversation, they've got to get some kind of credit for doing that late rotation because it might have been the only one. But, but I don't think anybody in the room is not writing them. I think there are students who are like, I, I didn't even ask for one because I already got all my interview slots. I think the message that everybody should be hearing here is that, uh, it's still helpful. Probably not in the AOA 250, 250 honors left radio buttons all the way down on both slows, like, no, I, I really don't need to write you one. <laughs> You're fine. But that being said, I think students should, even if they're rotating in December and they got a late rotation at Irvine, like, go ahead, write a slow, use it. Send it to somebody who cares, certainly if, like, I don't want to go to Irvine, I want to go to Stanford. All right, send it up to Sarah, you know. I think it's still helpful. What you're hearing here is that's still helpful. So I have a slightly different question. Uh, we have a lot of students who take four, five, six, seven years to graduate. So they may be doing their EM, God knows when. What, do they need to have these slows all within that same calendar year that they're applying? Or is it okay if it's two years, three years later? What would you say to them? 
That is an entirely different discussion with only program directors in the room and probably not in the spirit of this discussion, but I would say that would be a challenge for me to interpret those two data points three years apart. I'll leave it at that. So a lot of the angst, a lot of the frustration, and a lot of the realization that we may not solve this, I think, comes from goal number three. Identify the different stakeholders, the different shareholders, because these folks have very different goals for what the slow is going to produce. Um, students have an agenda. We as clerkship directors and advisors and advocates have an agenda. Deans have an agenda. Program directors and the people who do the interviews and screen have a very different agenda. So it's worth just knowing this so we can advise all of the people that have some sort of control over our job and our life. Quick show of hands again, survey. Uh, how many of your deans want to see your slows before you upload them? No. Yeah. How many of you know they can't? <laughs> they used to be able to. Yeah. No. Yeah. Right. 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 So uh, just for people that aren't familiar with this from a few years ago, so it was a bigger problem when the deans kind of things had to essentially go into the office first to get uploaded, and there was a little bit more of screening. So... From a medical school dean standpoint, this was kind of a hot topic because our letter is different than most other fields, although we're finding that orthopedics and ENT, ENT and a few other specialties are starting to go to standardized letters. We were one of the first ones to do it and really one of the first ones to accept it as kind of a norm. So the medical schools would look at it and say, wait a minute, letters of recommendation are supposed to be like, Johnny is great, and this letter is like Johnny's middle third. <laughs> uh, so what does this mean? So they were screening them, and they were telling students, you know, like, hey, you might not want to use that letter from Cincinnati because it's not quite as good as this other letter. So now that you can directly upload to the system, the medical schools have kind of lost that ability to do it, which I think is part of the reason why when you asked, there were very few hands mm -hmm. that went up because I think the schools are just accepting that these letters now get automatically uploaded, which I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, to have, but this, this slide is a good one to think through of just as you're in all your roles that are in here from a student advisor, uh, someone that's working with students in writing slows, someone that's reading them and from a program standpoint of getting the right people in the right fits for your program, you realize the different elements that are there. You know, the schools want their students to match. That that's yeah. why the deans were hot on this topic to see it because they felt like it was a reason why their students would match. The clerkship directors want to help their students and advise their students, and the programs want to have a tool that's helpful to cut down a thousand applications um, and make it so you can understand how students might be different, and then decide on your own which students are are the type you're looking for at your program. So it's a good slide just to understand those elements, but that's at least a little history of the dean's part of the whole deal. I think another piece too is I'm at an institution where the dean does want to know. Thank you the dean does want to know what's going into the letter of recommendation for students that struggle. And, you know, I'm torn because at the same time, I have to write a very honest letter. I mean, I'm thinking of you when I write my letter. I mean, this letter is not secret. It's going out, and you're <laughs> going to read it. And that's that's really who I feel obligated to do. So all these other stakeholders, while important, we're still trying to strike this balance of, of being honest and giving a candid evaluation, but still trying to help the student out as best as you can. So we are being pulled at many forces, but I think the, the most important driving force is, is each other. Like, we have to be honest to each other and write legitimate slows that don't over-embellish or under-embellish a, a student. And, and as for the clerkship directors in the room, this has to be a critical conversation with your dean. You must understand Kevin's paper. You must know that if your students are EM bound, and God, we've got 22 of them this year, you have to know how important this away rotation is and how important it is that they have block time in the early summer through early or late summer through early fall to get away. And if they don't understand that, go back from this meeting and have that schedule that meeting with your dean tomorrow. Because if there's one thing you could take away from that, it's that's the conversation you have to have with them. Because they don't understand how important this standard letter is. It is coming in other specialties, so they'll slowly grapple with it. But that was by far and away the most effective conversation I had with my dean seven years ago. You don't understand. We're different. So now that they know they have a couple of different shareholders they have to deal with, deans on one end, students on the other, and they know the importance of going back and explaining to them, 
how? How are they going to explain the challenges, the, the problems, the pluses and minuses of putting folks into this top third, middle third, and bottom third? <laughs> So as Tom so eloquently said at the beginning, I don't have any answers. Um, and you missed the conference call. And I missed the conference call, so i got to sign this one as well. Um, I will say just from a personal perspective, I'm really interested to see what comes out of the ESLO project to see um, exactly how people are actually using that bottom third category. Um, we, we do. We use it. We put not quite a third of our students in there, but we try. We try to get close. Um, and, again, it's all about being real and trying to adequately and accurately portray the breadth of the students that we see. Yeah. Obviously, writing the letters for the top 10% and top third is easy, right? It's the ones that are middle and lower that are more challenging to write. And so for those letters, in particular, the narrative comments are super valuable. Yeah. And I'm so so sorry. Christy just reminded me I was supposed to talk about something else. <laughs> um, the new ESLO kind of is an interesting twist on the idea. And one of the things that I thought this um, this application season and I was I was curious about was um what about the students that rotate in December, whoever said that, that I write a slow for because I write a slow for anyone who asks for one, um, that is in the bottom third and halfway through the rotation realizes, oh gosh, they're not going to write me a really good letter. I'm not even going to ask for one. Do I still write the letter because it shows up in the e-slow in my numbers or do I not write that letter and then my curve is skewed? Do you understand? Well, that's a big issue because it's hard to put somebody here. It's hard. So I, as much as I try, I can't really put 33% of them there. I get close. Maybe I put 27%. Maybe I put 25% of them there and I'm feeling good about myself. But we all know that 10 to 15% of the folks are really stinkers and 10 to 15% in that lower 25% are good. Now, when you're screening applications, you look at lower third, you go, ah, this is really lower quarter, and I know the bottom 10% can really be troublesome. This becomes a dirty pond for you to fish in, maybe. Um, how, how many of you readers this past year read a narrative that said, we just, our students were just too good, we couldn't put any in the bottom third this year? I know I did, yeah. It was Tom. That was Tom that said it. <laughs> he he lied about his numbers. I just did the math over here. He, it was he got zero percent in the lower third. But it's a right. This is a great uh, topic to throw up on the board because I think for a lot of people, probably even heading into this session, you're probably thinking this is like a hot topic, right? This whole concept of this lower third and the, this part of the slow and everything else, and uh, you totally get it how it affects different players that are are. This is important to you, anywhere from students to um, the programs and getting the right people in. And this one is the one I'd say if you think back to prior to the slower being around, so slower before slow, uh, everybody was good, right? Everybody's good. So the letter becomes less important. It's hard to know who you want to get to your place. The slow, the idea of it is there's a range of students. And if you look at everybody in this room, and especially the program directors in here, if you realistically think of your rank list each year and you think, okay, 1 to 100, who's student number 50? Student number 50 is usually pretty good. And student number 50, when you actually match them, sometimes is better than you thought the people that up top. They're called chief resident. Right? So this whole concept of some of these other thirds are bad, uh, the reality is you have a rank list. You have people that get numbered, and you do have a range, and there's reasons why they may be, um, but yet they might do different rotations, and maybe they rotate with Caitlin, and they f flourish in that environment, and they rotate at a totally different type, type of site they don't do as well. Well, you're learning something through those letters that might help you know if they're really good for, for your program. So even though I know this is one that people struggle with quite a bit, it's actually helpful, too, to get those people to the right programs. And I know it doesn't feel good to check some of those 
lower boxes, but that's where, as Sarah pointed out, the narrative section is so critical to explain why. Because some programs might look at a student with lower board scores, lower test score on the student rotation test, but clinically as a superstar and say, I want that student. That's someone I can work with and I can help them with it. And someone else might say, I don't know, I don't think I have time to help them with their test taking issues. Flip side, the person who gets 270 step one, but doesn't communicate super great. Uh, some programs would be like, I don't know, that doesn't seem like something we want to deal with. And someone else might be like, sign me up for that. That person's going to be fine. No problems. They're going to fly through a little autistic, but it'll work. Yeah. This will only work with good narrative, good narratives written and maybe more importantly, good narratives read. And I think I would challenge all of you in your slow writing committees to flip your workflow. 250, 250 AOA, I need to see three or four sentences. Top. Instead, what do we do in our committee, right? We spend all of this time writing these flourishing, glowing things of this. We know he's a guaranteed match already at three places versus the detailed narrative that we should spending most of our time on in those kids we're putting in the middle and bottom third with the details of getting them they're appropriate for emergency medicine. We got to find them the right place. So this is what we've got to put in that language. David. Hey, um, this is going to be a carryover conversation we had. I don't know how many people were in the application process improvement task force, but I'm going to ask a provocative question to others. Each year we have this conversation of this difficulty with the bottom third and people uncomfortable asking it, uh, using it. Are we repeatedly trying to fit a square peg into a round hole? Like, is it hard because it's not the right path, way to differentiate these learners? Mm. Do we need a different terminology? Why are we forcing this so much? I think part of it is bottom third means different things. Or those that, yeah, you just have a stellar group. For others, it's, yeah, this is one you're going to be careful of. And I don't know if this, the way we currently have it structured, allows us to differentiate that in a way that we want to. So we feel uncomfortable with this. And I just wonder why we're forcing it. Maybe we so you're to. saying if your slow writing committee puts somebody in the bottom third, they got to fill out another form? No, I'm just saying maybe <laughs> third is not. Maybe, the slow is beautiful because it differentiates learners. Maybe this is not the best way to differentiate learners. Maybe there's a way that we're more comfortable with that allows us to say, you know, there's problematic versus we'll do a good job. I agree with Sarah. It doesn't matter what you use. The top 10, top third in any ranking system are going to be easy. We're struggling with the bottom ranking, and maybe it's because artificially dividing into thirds is not a good way to differentiate our learners. Well, it's, it's, it's also, it is our priority tool to differentiate them right now, but it's only one of many points of data that we use to decide who's coming for interviews and ultimately who's getting ranked. And, and I do think we may have pendulum has swung to overemphasize it in some ways. But right now, it's still one of the pieces that we have. Um, Jules, did you want to holler something out? Yeah, I can holler. Hi. Um, I actually want to echo what you said, Tom, because I think that the concept of the third is on really speaks to what David was talking about. The problem I have with the bottom third is it's a mixed group of students. There are some students in the upper half of that group who are fine. They're not distinguished, but they're going to be fine. And then there's another set who I'm like, Oh, this person is not good. And <laughs> 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 they're actually very different. Right. I think that speaks to Damon's point. We we use this because it's convenient and it helps us protect our top third, right? What if my top 20% guy accidentally slips down into top 35? I've heard him. I've taken him out of top third, put him in middle third. It doesn't matter. He's 240, 240, good letters. He's going everywhere. But that protection of the top folks might come at risk to the bottom folks, which are probably the people we ought to be championing a little bit better for. And I had been making a suggestion, actually, that may not have made it up to you guys. Is I wonder if we ought to add something below Bottom third, something along the lines of not. A, well, no, no. Listen, hear me out. Either bottom ten or not appropriate for emergency medicine, or something that is a clear floor of where we're going. Because so our institution, we do not write letters for them. Well, and again, part of that problem is somebody else might, and so we should be able to write a bad letter for somebody. All right, we're down to like the last two to three minutes, and we've got a group coming in right behind us.
Um, we're not going to try and push forward with our slides because it'll take hours, but uh, we've only got a couple more moments for comments here. So realistically, though, uh, the program directors out there, if you get a lower, are you going to, are you going to invite that student? Because I'm a clerkship director. I'm a CD. I'm not a DC. I'm not a dream crusher. And so <laughs> I just want to know realistically, you know, because it's a struggle, right? We're, we keep talking about this, oh, we want to use a full range. Are we going to walk the talk, though? Are we going to really invite these students? Because honestly, all of the students that we have, luckily, want to do emergency medicine. They are really good. So if I put someone in the bottom third because I'm trying to use that full range and be a team player, are you going to invite those students? I will. I will. Okay, I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn the lights down <laughs> so we can be completely honest. And we'll just take a vote of yes or no, and you can shout it out. No, I'm kidding. How many uh, How many here will invite that person? Let's be real. Lower third. Without, without pathology. I What's that? Absolutely. Are you going to read the here, application? Without Are you going to read my narrative? Yeah, yes. that yeah, we're going to the narrative. 100%. I mean, they still have to have other data points, right? So lower third, lower third, 201, 212, plus uh, struggled in the busy clinical environment is a very different than a 201, 245, lower third, didn't do a lot of research, but boy, go find this person at Trauma Bay and they're going to shine. Yeah. That's a different, you've got to spend your time on that narrative piece, and that's what's helping those students out. But then yeah. should you put them in the lower third? Right, but yeah. you've got to right. tell people what they're going to need to succeed. You have to tell them clearly, concisely, and in, e in an easily readable fashion what they're going to need to succeed. And then if that program can supply that, they'd probably consider inviting them. We are at 11 o'clock. One last comment. Cut people off. I think, I think the hardest part about looking at some of the – the, you know, when you separate these students into thirds is when there's a lot of discordance between where they're ranked, where they're ranked in terms of the other rotators, and then where they would fall on that institutional rank list with maybe no narrative explanation. Yes. And I think for a lot of us, what I do if I see somebody in the lower third for that month is I want to know, okay, what's in the narrative? Would they still fall on that program's rank list? Because if they're lower third and not going to be ranked, to me that's the red flag. And then uh, what did they do with their uh, next month's rotation? Was there an improvement? And so I think those are the things we should look for in that Thank you, everybody. Group.